going to talk about documentation today. Uh, as was just said, I'm James Messenger. I'm the product director for ShipEngine. Quick one minute spiel on ShipEngine. We are a shipping and e-commerce API. So if you need to ship packages, track packages, uh, validate addresses, compare shipping rates, any of that kind of stuff, you can use our API to do that for any major carrier in the world. Uh, and if you're an e-commerce seller and you're selling on Shopify or Amazon or Etsy or whatever, you can use our API to uh, manage and fulfill all of your orders across all of these marketplaces. And if you're doing either one of those, talk to me afterwards and we'll talk. Uh, so at ShipEngine, we are about to start a revamp of our documentation, and so we've been doing a lot of thinking about uh, the kinds of things that we want in our documentation, what, what we want it to solve how it fits into our developer experience and how it can actually help improve our overall developer experience, um, how it can actually help the discoverability of our product and actually help drive awareness and uh, uh, organic growth. And then finally, the age-old question of build versus buy, which, you know, do we uh, build this ourselves or is there something off the shelf that we can use? So I'm gonna talk about these four things today, starting with the types of documentation. So every API, really every software product, needs these four types of documentation. Tutorials are your absolute beginner content. So for an API, uh, this would include things like how to create an account, how to get your API key, how to make that very first HTTP request. Uh, the point of a tutorial is not necessarily to solve a real business need. So we have a tutorial on ShipEngine that's just how to build a, a Twitter bot. That's not really a real business need, but it's something that a beginner can easily wrap their head around and uh, you know, that way they can focus on the steps of the tutorial and not trying to understand this broader business concept. So how-to guides are the business stuff, right? So how-to guides, you can skip the beginner stuff. You can skip how to create an API key, how to uh, create an account. You can assume they already know that. What you want to focus on in a how-to guide are the steps that are needed to actually achieve a business goal. So in ShipEngine's case, we have how-to guides on how to print a shipping label, how to track a package, how to validate an address, that kind of thing. Explanations are your broad concepts. So for an API, uh, an explanation is not gonna be about a specific endpoint or a specific feature of your product. Uh, it's about the, the kind of domain things that you need to know in order to even effectively use this product. Obviously in the shipping and logistics space, we've got all kinds of broad concepts about how logistics work and how warehousing works and that kind of thing. And then finally, you've got your reference docs. Reference docs are what every developer expects you to have. These are the information they need to do their job. It's uh, what endpoints you have, what headers they require, what fields they can set, which ones are required, which ones are optional, all that kind of stuff goes in your reference docs. Of course, it takes time and it takes effort to build all those docs, so where do you start? Where you start is reference docs. And why do you start there? For two reasons. One, it's table stakes. Everyone expects you to have reference docs. Every developer is just going to expect, you don't get bonus points for having reference docs. They're just expected. And they're also really easy to create because you can auto-generate them. You can use Postman or Stoplight or API-matic or Redoc. There's any number of tools in this space that you can use to generate reference docs really easily. Uh, and finally, if your API is an internal-only API, so it's not something you're selling to customers, it's just something that you need another department in your company to understand how to use, reference docs might be all you need. You don't need how-to guides and tutorials because that other department in your company probably already knows how things work in your company. They just need to know which API endpoints and what data to pass them. And the, the third and final thing I have over here is tutorials and explanations. It's not because they're any less important than these first two. It's just that they tend to be long form and therefore take more time and effort to write. So these, two, these first two are your big early wins. So you've got your four types of documentation. Now how do you actually display them to your user? One tempting way to do it would be to have four separate sections to your doc site. So your user goes to the tutorial section and sees the tutorial for feature number one. And then they go to the how-to section and they see a how-to guide on how to use feature number one. And then they go to the reference docs and they see the reference material for feature number one. The problem with that is that you're expecting your users to A, understand all these different types of documentation and B, think about, okay, the question that I need to know the answer to, is that gonna be a, a reference thing, or is that gonna be a how-to or a tutorial? Don't make your users think. Instead, you know that, or that they care about feature number one. Maybe they have a problem with feature number one, or maybe they just wanna know how feature number one works. So give them your docs grouped by feature or by use case, so they can just go to the docs for feature number one, and everything they need about feature number one is there, all the reference material, all the tutorials. Uh, don't make your users think. Oh, by the way, so, 
One possible exception to this is if you are using off-the-shelf tools for your docs, a lot of tools only do one type of, of documentation. So you might be using one tool that only provides reference docs and then another tool that only, only like a CMS that only does tutorials. Uh, and so you may end up having to go with this structure simply because you have different tools for them. But, uh, developer experience. So when thinking about your docs, you need to think broader than just your documentation. The developers who are using your documentation are also using a whole suite of developer tools to uh, enable them, you know, their developer workflow. And so you want to uh, make your docs work hand in hand with those tools. So obviously there's Postman. Every API developer is using Postman. Every API consumer is using Postman. So give them some Postman collections that they can download right in their document, or right, right in your documentation. Uh, bonus points if you have separate Postman collections for each section of your documentation. So rather than just having one big Postman collection that's, here's every single API endpoint in our docs, you can give them, you know, for each feature in your documentation, you have like the Postman collection for that feature. Open API and JSON schema are uh, popular formats that are supported by a wide array of tooling, especially Open API in, in our space. Every product out there supports Open API, so provide downloadable uh, you know, links in these formats. And then finally, the run and postman button. So quick show of hands, who here knows what the run and postman button is? This is a good answer. Okay, so for the rest of you, I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, tell you about it. Um, so one way that you could share postman collections in your docs is that you could expo export the postman collection as a JSON file, and then you could just provide a link to download that JSON file. Or in Postman, for any given collection, you can generate a run and Postman button. It's just two lines of HTML or Markdown that you throw in your docs. And now there's a button in your docs that a user can click. And with one click, it automatically launches Postman or prompts them to install it if they don't have it, downloads your collection, and opens it for them. So one click, and this developer is now has your API up in front of them, ready to start actually interacting with. Even better, the, post, the run and Postman button supports personalization so that you can do something like, for example, when it pops up Postman, it actually already has their credentials, their API key, that kind of thing, so that they're instantly using your API with their data, not just generic sample data. SDKs. So every REST API needs a native SDK. The only question is whether you're gonna build it or you're gonna make your customers build it. If you're a Python developer, you, and you're calling a REST API, you're gonna create Python wrappers around that REST API so that you can write nice, friendly, familiar, native Python code to call that API. Same thing goes for .NET or Go or any other language. Um, the problem is that if you have hundreds of customers, thousands of customers, you probably have many customers who are using Python, and each of those customers is reinventing the wheel, creating a new Python SDK for your, for your API and with varying levels of quality. One customer might forget to uh, include error handling, and another customer might forget to use retry logic, and any number of things. So you're better off providing the SDKs to your customers uh, so that you can handle all that kind of stuff and just make their job easier. There's a whole bunch of other reasons why SDKs are good, and I could go into those, but this talk isn't about SDKs, it's about docs. So what I wanna talk about is this last one, which is that once you provide SDKs, they become the primary method of using your API. To that Python developer who's using your Python SDK, your product is not a REST API, your product is a Python library. As far as he's concerned, you're giving him a Python library, he doesn't care that behind the scenes it uses a REST API to do its work. So this changes how you write your documentation. All of a sudden, you're documenting not a REST API, but a Python library, or a Java library, or a Go library, or whatever. So you're not documenting HTTP endpoints and verbs, you're documenting classes and methods. Uh, your code samples in your docs now need to not just be generic code samples, they should be using your SDK. So there's a lot of tools out there that will generate code samples in multiple languages, you know, Python, Node, whatever, but they, they do that using generic request response code. So it's 11 lines of Python code that shows you how to create a request, set the headers, populate the body, send the request, wait for the response. That's not what you want. What you want is, you know, in Ship Engine's case, our SDK, you know, the code sample would be import ship engine SDK and then ship engine dot track package, right? Two lines of code, nice and simple. Um, because you are documenting a software product now, not just an API, you should also include things that you wouldn't include in an API. Things like installation instructions, npm install this or pip install that. Uh, IDE and editor screenshots. So for a Python SDK, you'll want to include some PyCharm screenshots. For a Java SDK, maybe IntelliJ screenshots. For a C Sharp SDK, some Visual Studio screenshots. Think about how your user is actually using your product. And remember, if you're providing the SDKs, your product is not the API, it's the SDK. Discoverability. 
So the big thing that I wanna drive home here is that your docs are about more than documenting your product, they are part of your content strategy. This is especially true, obviously, if you're a public API that you know, you're selling your API to customers. Uh, go talk to your marketing department and you'll find out that they have a whole content strategy and everything they do, every blog article they write, every page on the website is optimized for SEO and for shareability on social media and has all kinds of analytics so that they can tell which things are working and which things aren't. You need all the same stuff in your docs. All right, in Ship Engine's case, we want people to be, that have never heard of Ship Engine to be able to find us because they went to Google and typed, how do I print a UPS shipping label? Right, so we need good SEO in order for that to work. Shareability, we want people, once they fight, figure out, oh, I found out on Ship Engine's docs how to print a UPS shipping label, you want them to be able to send that link to their colleague via email or Slack or whatever. Uh, so you wanna make that easy to do. Uh, and then analytics, uh, we need analytics on our docs so that we can, we, the people at Ship Engine, can determine, oh, this page is really popular, or we notice that there's a constant flow. People who go to this page next go to this page and then this page, so we, we can maybe optimize for that flow or recommend it to people. How does all that start? Well, it starts with metadata. So if you are using a CMS like Word, uh, WordPress or something like that, um, or if you're using some of the off-the-shelf documentation products, they may be generating this metadata for you. You don't have to worry about it. Your job's done. You're good to go here. But if you're building it yourself, you have to build all this metadata yourself too. Um, this is essential for shareability and for, uh, for uh, SEO. So JSON-LD is a format, it's a JSON format, obviously, uh, that is used by all of the search engines. It's incredibly important that you have this for SEO, and uh, it, it not only determines how your content is categorized on, say, Google, but how it's displayed. Now, if you're using a CMS like WordPress that's more generic, not specifically tailored to APIs, JSON-LD has all these different schema types, and WordPress would use your generic schema types like organization and article. Uh, because it's meant more for blogs. There are specific schema types for web API and API reference. So if you're building it yourself or if you have the ability to customize your WordPress instance, try to use the most specific uh, schema type that you can. Uh, Twitter cards and open graph. Uh, obviously, if you wanna encourage shareability on Twitter and Facebook, those are important formats, but actually those two formats are used by everybody. So Slack, for example, defaults to oembed but if you don't have OEmbed, because it's a bit complicated, it requires a standalone server, it'll fall back to either Twitter or, or OpenGraph. And so what does all this stuff give you? Uh, as I mentioned earlier with JSON-LD, that gives you the ability to customize your search results, but all these other formats, they're metadata that, have you ever shared a link uh, on Slack and you get that nice little preview image and a, a title and a summary? All that comes from this metadata. So that's why you want it. Uh, page per topic. Um, so the idea here is there's a lot of uh, API docs that are just one long page. Uh, you've probably all seen these that you know, you'll have usually a, a single or a three column, you know, really long docs that is the entire API and there's the left column is, you know, a nav bar so you can jump to specific second, sections, but that's just one page, which means it's one page with one title with one set of metadata and only one entry in Google search index. So someone will find your API if they're specifically searching for ship engine API. But if they're searching for how do I print a UPS shipping label, they're not gonna find you because while you have that in your docs, it's buried way down on that page and Google doesn't think it's important. So you want a separate page for each topic of your docs. Now maybe that's a se separate page for each endpoint or maybe it's a separate page for each uh, feature in your app, that's up to you. But keep in mind that each individual page that you create is an opportunity for you to have a customized title, customized metadata, customized preview image, all that stuff so that when people are sharing on, on social media or searching on, on Google, they can find you. Uh, and then also analytics. By having separate pages uh, for everything on your, on your docs, it's very easy to notice which pages are most popular and which pages people are traveling through. Progressive enhancement is an old SEO technique from back in the 90s. You know, don't rely on JavaScript. Your content should still load without JavaScript. So I almost considered not putting this in here until I realized that most of the API documentation uh, platforms that are out there rely on JavaScript. If you turn off JavaScript, uh, many of them, the content won't even load at all because they rely, they rely on Ajax to go get the content. Some of them, the content for the page you're on will load, but then if you try to use any, click any of the links to go to another page of the docs, those links won't work because they're using JavaScript navigation. So it's important that you, you don't rely on JavaScript. So build or buy. Five minutes left to talk about build versus buy. So <laughs> um, we're spoiled for choice in the API ecosystem. We have a ton of great tools for building API docs. Uh, many of you might recognize these logos. Some of these logos are even represented out in the vendor hall. Um, it's 
it's really easy to build really good docs for APIs these days, especially if you've got like a Swagger definition or an open, open API definition. So why would you choose to uh, buy something as opposed to building it yourself? Well, uh, the obvious one is faster time to market. All right, you don't have to spend time building something yourself. You can just have docs tomorrow by going to Postman or API-matic or whatever and just generating them. Um, it lets you focus on your main product rather than focus on focusing on building a documentation platform from scratch. Uh, and you know, if, if, you're, um, if you don't think there's a competitive advantage that you can gain by, having, by spending all that work building your own custom documentation platform, then just use an off-the-shelf one. You're better off going that way. Uh, and finally, you may have a lack of expertise. All, you know, it takes a, a lot of work to build your own custom documentation platform, and if you don't have the, the skill set for that on staff, then there's, these are great products with a lot of value that you get. But on the other hand, <laughs> it's also really easy to build yourself. It's never been easier, in fact. These top two rows here are all static site generators uh, that each focus on, on different things, and they're all really good products. Uh, Gatsby and, and React Static are both um, focused on React, but they, all, they, both, they use pre-rendering so that you get the benefits of React, but also the benefits of SEO and not relying on JavaScript for your content. Jekyll, Hugo, Metalsmith, they're your more, your more uh, traditional uh, static site generators, and then Docusaurus, which is an amazing name, am I right? It's an amazing name. Um, they, they focus specifically on docs, and so they have some documentation specific, specific features like the ability to have multiple versions of your docs side by side, that kind of thing. Regardless of which one of those you use or if you use a different one to build, build yourself, these, this bottom row is different technologies you can use to empower that. So OpenAPI uh, obviously is a great way to generate docs at, from your OpenAPI definition. Swagger CodeGen, uh, is an open source project, I think owned by SmartBear, I could be wrong on that. Um, that makes it really easy to generate code, docs, all kinds of stuff from your open API definition. And then the last logo here is a brand new technology called Markdown Extended, or MDX, that is, it combines Markdown and React. So you get all of the benefits of Markdown where it's nice and easy to write, just like on Slack and GitHub, but then whenever you need some piece of rich content, you can just throw a React component right there in the middle of your Markdown, it's really cool but also very, very immature. <laughs> um, so why would you choose to uh, build instead of just buying something off the shelf? Well, the number one reason is flexibility and control. All right, so when you buy a vendor product, you are buying into that vendor's version or vision of how your docs should look and how they should work. Maybe that's good enough for you or maybe it's not. You get control by building it yourself. And then I talked earlier about product differentiation. Uh, if you believe that you can build something better than what the vendors are offering you, or th that you're willing to put in the time and effort to do that because it's something your competitors aren't doing, uh, then you can get competitive advantage and product differentiation by doing that. Obviously, there's some other benefits like no vendor lock-in and you, know, you, can, you can customize it with your workflow, that kind of thing. Uh, personalization, I talked about earlier with like the run and post them button. Personalization is a really great way to, to make your developer experience better by imagining your docs, uh, obviously all of your code samples, instead of just saying your API key here, they can literally have the, the, your customer's API key in the code sample. You could do things like if, you're, uh, if you have different tiers for your API, then you could customize the docs based on what tier the current user is, is signed up for, that kind of stuff. And then SEO, um, the ability to fully customize and have full control over your SEO and your social media shareability. Uh, like I said, a lot of the off-the-shelf products have that stuff built in, but it, uh, you're, again, relying on their vision of how that should work rather than customizing it yourself. So my final recommendation on build versus buy is that if your API is your product, so if that is the thing that your company sells, it's probably worth taking the time and effort and investment to build a custom tailored documentation platform for your product. Um, it's a good opportunity for you to differentiate between you and your competitors and provide a first class developer experience. The downside, you're gonna have to hire a dedicated DX team, <laughs> which isn't cheap, so just be aware of that. But for everyone else, uh, buy, right? Like if your API is just a feature of your larger product, it's probably not worth the, the investment. You're not gonna get enough ROI of, of building your own platform. Uh, for, like I said earlier, for internal APIs, the auto-generated docs are probably good enough. They're probably all you need. And then if you're an early stage product, you need to be focused on your core product offering, not on building a, a bespoke API documentation platform. That's not the best use of your time. So that's my recommendation there. And that brings us finally to questions.